Okay, so uh, I am going to ask you a question to both of you, and I'm going to give you some time to think about the answer because okay, I think it's a pretty <laughs> it's a pretty important answer for the city of Houston. Um, so here's the question. So if Houston wanted to do something like what both of you just described, um, give us maybe two or three teaching points that we can leave this auditorium and go out and either start talking about or start working on or both. Right? So I'm going to give you some time to think about that. And as they're thinking of that, I'm going to remind the audience that in about five to ten minutes, we're going to open up the auditorium for your questions. Right? So start formulating, and uh, Mary Lou, I think, is around with the microphone. Um, so have you, have you had enough consultations? Uh, can I right. start and then? So y'all make sure you got your uh, pens and paper, right? So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple, and then you can clean up whatever train wreck I, I leave behind. Um, so I think the, the first thing is, one, I mean, Houston is a place that has, I mean, has the best charter network in the country. I mean, I mean, yes, PrEP has proven, and I mean, so one is figure out a way to scale up the great charters that are here. Um, and I think that's, that's, part of, that's part of the solution. And do it in a way where, you know, the buildings are made available, the per people is the same. I mean, in Memphis, we are giving the charters the building. I mean, they're not paying rent. I mean, the taxpayers already paid for that building. The building doesn't belong to the district. The building belongs to the people. We're giving the building to the, to the charters and saying the only thing you have to pay for are your utilities. And so one is find the great charters that are there and scale them up. But then secondly, I think it's, it, you know, it's looking at who are your top 5% principals in your district right now? I mean, there are great principals in every single system. Give them charter-like autonomy. This doesn't have to be called a charter. What it's called is not important. What's important is, is that you're giving the autonomy around people and program and time and money to your best educators. And when you do that, the signal that that sends to everybody else in the system around what is important, I mean, it sends a very, very big message. And I think if you can find those great people that are already there and free them up and give them charter-like autonomy, which is 100% of the per pupil, like I talked about, and, and scale up the great charters, then I think that you know those are, are two places that uh, that you could start. Uh, that's great. I totally agree with Chris. Um, it might be worth thinking about this in terms of kind of phase one and phase two. I think in, in my short experience in Houston, you guys are kind of in the middle of phase one. In the middle of phase one is getting a ton of talent, you know, through Teach for America, your universities, the new teacher project, and so forth, and getting some great charter operators on the ground. That's kind of the coalition you need to actually prove that in the classroom it's possible. In our experience, phase two of scaling, of taking that, and in our case, going to 85% charter, it's fundamentally wasn't possible in New Orleans without political leadership. In, in education in our country, there's kind of three ways you can have vehicles for political leadership. An elected school board, mayoral control, or a state takeover. Um, in our cases, they were both done through the state. Louisiana created the Recovery School District, which was a state takeover entity. Tennessee created the Achievement School District and then you know, went out and recruited one of the best in the country. So the two folks who have made some headway have done it through the state. I think if you get a reform school board that's committed to this, it's possible. It's possible to mayoral control. I think every city is going to be different. Um, but if you don't have three to five years of a political window where you can just turn it on and say, any charter that wants to grow, we're going to give you free facilities. Um, all the great people who want to come, we're going to empower you. You need some political window, otherwise it's just all these fights that are marginal in one way or the other and things change every year. Uh, in our experience, again, the state has provided that with the Achievement School District and the bottom 5% and the Recovery School District. But I don't think you can really get to scale or go all the way until you have some kind of political cover for kind of four to six years of the real work to happen.
So do you, do you think that the state needs to play a role in this, or is it both of your beliefs, like a local school district with the right type of politics, the right type of uh, leadership, could do this on their own? It's a great question. To be honest, I don't know. Um, you know, I think we're so early into this. I can yeah. tell you the New Orleans story, which was it would never have happened without the state intervening. We were just in such, I mean, very quickly, the FBI actually in 2004 rented the floor above the New Orleans School Board and set up a sting office, like straight out of the wire, and convicted 21 people working in the district from stealing from children. It was that atrocious and that bad. We weren't going to do it from within. We had to have the state come in. That being said, over the next two to three years, the state's going to pull out, and we're most likely going to go back to an elected school board. So it wouldn't shock me if the story of New Orleans is you needed the state to come in, but it really was a temporary injection to allow some entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and we hope we can prove that long term uh, an elected school board can actually sustain the system. But we really don't know yet. And I, I don't think I know enough to know what makes sense in any given city. You want to answer? Or is that a, that's a pretty good answer? Yeah. yeah. It's possible. I mean, watching my wife sit on the school board for four years, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that. The system's going to change from within. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, I have to ask this question. Um, and then we're going to, I, I promise, then we're going to go to, to y'all. Um, so you know this story, right? So, uh, so I'm in a school district, and um, we're talking about relinquishing. And uh, my boss, in a private moment turns to me and he says this so if I have these kids and I'm teaching these kids but you demonstrate to me that you can teach my kids better as an educator as a public school educator isn't it my moral and ethical duty to pass my children over to you. And I guess my question is, in, in, in your experiences, what is, what's the hesitation around relinquishing? If, it, if, if, if public school educators to the core believe that the children's learning is the most important, why don't we relinquish more? Let me take it. I think it depends on what level in the system you're in. Um, I think for teachers and principals, I mean, they'd be <clears throat> as quick to the take on relinquishing as, as I, I am, or as near this. I think the further you get up in the system, I mean, let's be honest, most superintendents have egos, and their egos are part of why they've been able to get to the place that they've gotten to. Um, most elected officials have egos. It takes ego to put yourself out there publicly and run for office. And I think that when you relinquish, what's either explicit or implicit is that you're a failure, um, that you don't know what to do, and that you shouldn't be in the role. And I think that what we can do as, as leaders in the community is not only provide cover when those decisions get made, but demand it. Um, I mean, you can't argue with the results that Nira just put up, and I hope that we have those same kind of results soon. Um, but when folks take that step and are willing to do that, um, I mean, in the case of, I mean, Lee, you know, what, what, where was the cover? You know, there was a great front page story in the Chronicle, and then day in and day out, Bill Durbin had to fight battles in the school to make sure that things got done. And it, you know, there was no cover, and after a while, you just sort of question whether it's worth it or not, and you just get worn down. And I think um, that's the role the public can play, is to provide that cover. And I think what's even more powerful is demand that it be done. Uh, I totally agree with Chris. I think this is not a teacher or principal issue. This is a higher up issue, and, it, and it's a leadership issue. And when you look at the greatest leaders you know, in the, in the past hundred years that our world has seen, if you take Gandhi or Martin Luther King or the Dalai Lama or go back to George Washington, 
all of those people, though uh, the word marginalizes their greatness, they were relinquishers. I mean, they fought for change and at every time they could have taken power, but they didn't. And they only fought to hand power back to the people they were serving. And our urban superintendents and our school board members need to lead at that level. And I think, unfortunately, right now, we have a crisis in leadership that isn't willing to lead with that service orientation. Until that happens, I don't think principals and teachers are ever going to get the power they deserve. That's great. OK, let's take some uh, questions from the uh, audience. I don't know whether we're going to raise the house lights. It's going to be kind of hard to see who's asking the questions. There's a question right down here, Sharon. Hi. Hold on a minute. Okay. You got you got to get a, a microphone. Don't fall, Mary Lou. Good morning. Um, my question is about the relinquishing. Um, having attended schools that were really, really poor um, economically and in performance, um, how do you relinquish um, power back to schools who are not serving kids well? Because one of the reasons that states or whatever whatever entity comes in and takes over is to ensure that the kids are actually, because we were being graduated, but we weren't learning. So how, how do you balance that? Well, I think, is this on? You know, I think that um, it kind of goes back to what, I mean, so the big thing here in Houston, I guess it was, what, early 90s, was shared decision-making committees, right? And the whole idea was to decentralize the district. And what I don't want you to walk out of here hearing is that relinquishing is shared decision-making version 2.0, because that's not what it is. It's, it's very different. And what's different about it is that when you give autonomy to numb schools, you're going to get horrible results, right? And, and I think in, when the district did that, you saw a huge variation of results. The people that had the capacity to take on the autonomy ran with it and were in heaven. And the vast majority of the district, there was no effort made to ramp up the talent and the human capital to make sure that when that autonomy gets passed down, the people that are on the ground can take advantage of it. And so if, if we do this, or when we do this, it has to be done where you're ramping up your human capital capacity at the same rate you're giving power back down to the ground level. And it, if you only get half the equation right, it's going to be a disaster. Um, or it'll just be pockets of success. And pockets of success is what we've seen. I mean, there are great schools in HISD. There are great schools in Memphis. Not many, but there are a few. Um, and, and, and we don't need to replicate that. We need to replicate success in every classroom and every school. Um, it's a really, really great question. I think we've struggled with this a lot. In our minds, that's kind of where the 5% rule came from. If you're taking the top 5% of your people every year, and those are the people you're empowering, over time, you know, it's going to take a little longer, and it might take 10 or 15 years. But imagine if every year you're giving the top 5% of your people in the system the power to run their own schools. That'll build, um, but I think if you do it too quickly and get ahead of your talent, you're going to be in for major issues. But. And the Rob, since you got the microphone, and we're we're going to take the next question in just a minute, but I want you to talk to the audience about something that I heard you uh, say yesterday, and that is, uh, so you're already thinking about your next push in terms of uh, schools that you have to take on, uh, and uh, you kind of describe these as uh, sort of nice places. Uh, parents like to send their kids, but when you look at the data, the data kind of stinks. Yep. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so it, it seems as though your job's fixing to get a little hard. Yeah, yeah this right? is something we're really, really worried about. You know, we've done, and New Orleanians have done an incredible job of standing up and saying, you know, when we have a dropout factory, um, when a school's falling apart, we're not going to stand for that anymore. And the question in New Orleans isn't really anymore about which, whether a charter school should come in, it's about which charter school. So people are having the debate about which charter school is going to be the best to serve our community, and that's where you want the debate to be. Um, but what we're seeing, and as that chart showed, in three to four years, those schools are going to be gone in New Orleans, which is going to be an amazing moment for the city, but nowhere near where we want to get long term. And so the next wave of transformations is going to be in a set of schools 
that are safe, that parents are generally happy with, but are not academically rigorous and that are not preparing kids at the level that need to be prepared. And what kind of community courage and political courage is it gonna to go to take and say that school's not good enough? Because they feel good and you walk through the halls and they're nice places and there's good art on the wall, um, but if you really know instruction, it's not happening. So that's gonna be the next wave of work and we're not gonna go from C to A until we as a city say that's not good enough. Uh, and that worries me, because there's a certain sense of, thank God, better than before, we can rest now in New Orleans. Uh, and if that sentiment takes hold, we're gonna plateau very, very quickly. So I wanted to ask that question, because a lot of times in urban school districts, we sort of get this attitude, as, as, as long as we kind of clean up our trash, it's gonna be a, a, a better district. But if you really wanna be a great district, it seems to me like those are the types of schools yep that is sort of like the next level to take on. Yeah, and this is why it's so important, and you guys are so fortunate to have a yes or somebody like that in your community. If you don't have a school that you can't take a parent to or a politician to, to say every school could be like this, it's really hard to change the vision of expectations. Uh, but you all have that in your community, and uh, you should use that. Okay, next question. Uh, good morning. Just by way of transparency, I'm a former uh, TFA alum and I work in HISD. I wanted to explore the, the concept of family choice. HISD touts itself as a school district that has school choices, many different types of magnet programs that parents can apply to. What we know, though, is about 80% of the Caucasian students in HISD take advantage of those choices. Most of the minority students in the district don't take advantage of those choices. Um, any number of reasons could be there to, to, to explain that. What I want to know is I see a commonality between both of you all's program that says families get to choose. How are you teaching your families how to choose which schools to, to go to? Well, actually, our families don't get to choose. Um, we, uh, the way the law was written in Tennessee is the charge that we authorize are only authorized to enroll kids that are in the bottom 5%. Um, so it's not an open enrollment charter. Um, and the charters that come into Memphis, uh, they re it's a replacement strategy. Um, but I was, the way I was describing it last night is this isn't the charter school that sets up across the street and you know, slowly kids trickle in and slowly kids trickle out of the, of the neighborhood public school. The charter school becomes neighborhood school. It's replacing a failing school. So it can happen a grade at a time or it can happen full school. But, you know, I feel like, you know, we've been, we've had the same tired argument for 20 years about charters cream and you get your results because of X, Y, and Z. And I think besides all the other things that we talked about around why I think these are, you know, this is a huge opportunity is we have another opportunity to just put that myth to bed. Um, you're the neighborhood school and every kid that's zoned to that school, um, you have to serve. And in our schools, I mean, we're, we're serving 30% SPED population. Um, and charters are stepping up to the plate, taking that on. Um, and so when we get the results that I know we're gonna get, um, you know, that's, that, that's the deal. So this, you know, we may move later on to a more of an open choice system, um, and families can opt out. So if they don't wanna send their kid to one of our schools, they can go to the closest neighborhood school, but this isn't um, an open enrollment system that in exactly the same way that it is in New Orleans. Now, that doesn't mean we're still not educating parents on what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and what excellence looks like. And I think that really speaks to the heart of your, of your question is, you know, there's a, there's a parent education piece and a community education piece, especially if it's a community that hasn't seen excellence. In the neighborhood that we're in right now, there's 14 schools in the community. Uh, it's, it's a community called Fraser in North Memphis. There's two feeder patterns and there's 14 schools. 12 of the 14 schools in that community are in the bottom 5% of the state. So if you think about that as a parent, the chances that you're gonna send your baby to pre-K and they're gonna spend their entire public education from pre-K to 12th grade in a school that's in the bottom 5% in a state that's 47th in the country, when 12 of the 14 are, is pretty high. And so families just, they haven't seen what excellence looks like, which to Mir's point I think is so important for us to get out and show them what excellence is. And that, that's what we started to do, and that's, that's how we're trying to educate our parents and community on what they need to be demanding so that long after we're gone, whatever change we make is sustainable. Uh, really quick, this is a, a question that really troubled us. 
One uh, quick piece of research on this, they actually tracked, um, Ohio has a lot of choice, and there was a study where they tracked the decisions families made, and they tracked over two to three years, and at the end, on average, parents had moved their kids from higher performing schools to lower performing schools, which shows there's just huge information problems. Um, we are not where we need to be on this. We've, uh, our organization helped publish a parent's guide, so we publish a guide that has one page on every school. We get it out to all the communities, has program offers, test scores, and everything. Um, we also worked with the Urban League to do uh, what we called Pride courses, where we worked with groups of about parents and 20 at a time, and actually just taught them about the state accountability system and how to interpret test scores. Uh, but we have yet gotten to scale, and this is still something that worries us. One positive piece of evidence that we're slowly getting there, for the first time this year, we were actually able to see the curve we wanted when we plotted out um, parents' applications to schools versus performance, the line was actually in the right direction. And the top five to 10 performing schools got the most applications from parents. But that's still not perfect, and we still have schools that are really not great places that parents are signing up for. And at, you know, at the end of the day, you shouldn't even need government to close down a failing school. If you have choice, you should just have no parents ever signing up for that. And we are not there yet, and until that happens, I don't think we'll really have proven that parent choice is totally the powerful force we hope for it to be. So like, like a year ago, I think it was about a year ago, um, a new nonprofit formed in Houston. And I, I know about this because we share space over at uh, uh, the Red Cross building with them. Matt Barnes and families in Pounds, right? Um, and so I've, I've heard a lot of different titles about what those groups do, but um, I'm, I'm gonna call them a choice education group, right? Um, the question is, do you have those? In the areas that you're that, that you're working, uh, and if you do, how effective have they been at very quickly educating families around how important these choices are for their children? Yeah. I can answer this one really quickly. We have them, and we haven't been tremendously effective yet. And I think it's something we need to improve on. I don't know. I mean, I'd say uh, it, it varies depending on where. I mean, in Memphis, I think it's been very effective. I mean, we. We, we went in and the state took over schools and there was not only not the 100 parents protesting out front, people were welcoming us into the community and excited that we were there. And I think it's because there's a sense of urgency that exists. I mean, part of it's because 68 <laughs> of the schools that are in the bottom 5% are in Memphis, so it creates a sense of urgency. But we've reached a point in time there where the philanthropic community, the parent community, you know, the leadership in the city, every all the stars have lined up and everyone recognizes that there's about a three to five year window, like Nira mentioned, where we gotta step on the gas and make this happen. Um, and I think that you know Stanford Children's been been there a long time and I think they've done a lot of great work to, to help sort of till the soil so that we can get in there now and, and do the work. Next question. Just to follow up on this a little bit more, um, and Chris, it sounds like it's not really been an issue for y'all, but what, if any, resistance do y'all face from parents and communities when you start trying to shut down a failing school, when you start trying to remove teachers or principals that are substandard? Uh, what are y'all facing from the communities and how are y'all dealing with that? Uh, great question. This has been hard in New Orleans. Um, partly it was circumstantial. The first couple years, I mean, it was just the wild, wild west after the storm. Like a charter school would pop in up in a neighborhood, nobody had been consulted, and so it set kind of a bad precedent. Um, we're much better now, and again, the debate that's happening in New Orleans is not should the school close, it's who should get control of the school. And that's really where the major fights are happening, uh, which is progress in some sense. But it's still, to be honest, very political. Uh, it often cuts across racial lines, uh, and particularly in the high schools. Um, in New Orleans, where you went to high school is a very, very important deal. And they have alumni associations. Um, so for a high school, you know, the class of 65 might actually put a charter application in. And so might Kip. And you can imagine uh, <laughs> the, the context of when those two folks go up in front of the Board of the Education 
and the class of 65 says we want our charter to run the school and Kip says you know we think we can deliver something uh, there will be debates uh, and very rigorous debates and but those are the things those are the questions communities need to be asking themselves you know who can best serve our children so we're asking the right questions uh, I wouldn't say the debate is at the level we want it when we're totally talking about student outcomes and there's still a decent amount of power and politics involved. Um, but, you know, that's life. I don't know if that's ever totally going to go away, and you do what you can. Uh, but in New Orleans, it really is who gets to operate the school, not whether we should do something about it. Uh, we've, I don't know how we've been able to dodge a bullet, but we've dodged a bullet on this one. Um, and, and, and we have, you know, spent a lot of time laying the groundwork. I think the one thing that we did do that helped well, I think there were two things. One is we didn't we didn't do a high school right out of the gate, so we didn't have to deal with a lot of the alumni issues New York talked about. You know, we're in elementary and middle schools right now, um, and there's just not that same allegiance to you know name, color, mascot sort of sort of stuff. I think the second thing is we're focusing on feeder patterns, so we're not just randomly in schools all over the city where you have to build like ten different sets of relationships and community map ten different neighborhoods and figure out you know who in those ten. We pick one, and it allows to really be laser-like focused on who in this community do we need to be talking to, um, and and that focus allowed us to build those relationships in, in a pretty quick order. Um, and then I think the, the last thing is, I think we were we were practical about what we asked for. When I went sat and sat down and talked to somebody, I didn't say, "Hey, we need you to run around and be a cheerleader for this thing," because quite honestly, we haven't done anything yet. So all I need you to do is just be cautiously optimistic and give us the time and space to do the work. Because every minute I'm out in the community fighting a political battle with somebody is a minute we're not making sure that we've got the right people in the school doing the right thing. And would you rather have me out doing that or would you rather have us out making sure the school's not in the bottom 5%? So just give us a runway to do the work and then in a year, if we haven't delivered results, then absolutely hold us accountable. And I think that was a reasonable request that people were willing to stand back and give us some time and space to see what we can do. And and the, the track record at yes, you know, was, was helpful to get some of that instant credibility for us to be able to do that. So that question was actually asked by Sean Gross, and Sean serves on the A plus Board of Trustees. So this gives me an opportunity to recognize them as a group because actually we couldn't do any of this uh, without a very supportive uh, group of, uh, of board members. So thanks to the a plus board. Next question. Doug Selman. Uh, this may be a question more for Scott, but uh, given the control that the Texas legislature has on education in, in the state, what real flexibility do superintendents have uh, to be relinquishing control? Well, I, you know, I think that's fixing to change. Um, we spent some time in Austin and um, they're talking about it, um, I, I think, uh, both on, on both sides uh, of the aisle, um, in, in both the House and the Senate. Um, I think somebody alluded, I think it was Nirov, what, what's the last 20 years really gotten us, yeah. right? And, they, and, and they're talking about that. Wouldn't you agree, Diane? Yeah. In Austin, right? Yeah. Now, what they're going to do about it is you know a different issue. One of the things that's kind of a concern uh, of, of ours, and Nirav, and I think both Chris alluded to this last night, it seems as though the conversation in Austin has moved away from principal leadership and teacher quality into school choice and state charters. And what we're trying to remind the legislators, the state leaders of, is so you can talk about state charters, you can talk about school choice. But if you don't have principal leadership and you don't have teacher quality, you're not gonna go, you're not gonna get too far. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Fine. Next question. This question I think is more for Nirav. Um, and I guess the, the previous question about um, the community backlash is sort of related. I'm wondering if there's any concern for um, sort of centralized communities. Of course, Holmes is a community. I'm sure New Orleans is very similar. And so I'm wondering if there's any concern about 
dispersing students across the city, um, whether or not those communities have a centralized place anymore, and whether or not families and parents are considering that as well when they're thinking about where to send their, their students. It's a great question. So this is something I've actually changed my mind on. I'm from a small town in Indiana, and the idea, we didn't have a neighborhood, we had a town, <laughs> and, that, and that was it. Uh, and I don't think I understood how in bigger cities neighborhoods are so important. So I was the, the head cheerleader for all choice all the way. Um, and I, I still am in a very real way. And you know, one of the questions I always ask myself when I'm trying to figure these things out is what do rich people do? Because they have the option to do whatever they want. And instead of my opinions, that's kind of a test market for me of what people actually do when they have power. Um, and rich people send their kids all over town to the best schools they can get into. So on some level, I think you can't take away that option because people of means exercise that, which leads me to believe that people who don't have means would like that power as well. That being said, um, what's changed my mind is hearing people talk about what it means when the school they went to, and they live two blocks away, fills up um, by a citywide lottery and their kid has to hop on a bus and go 20 minutes away and the way to the bus route they pass their neighborhood school like that's a big deal um, so what we've done to try to create a compromise here is it's optional on the charter so the charter can say we want to stay citywide but if a charter wants a more neighborhood um, feel to it we're allowing them to take 50 percent so if there are 500 kids school they can take 250 of their slots and give neighborhood preference so we have a citywide algorithm in New Orleans uh, that we're still tweaking, but every parent lists seven schools. So you actually don't go to the school anymore in rural because we didn't want there to be any accusations that a charter is playing a game and they see a kid come in in a wheelchair and you know they say, oh, we're full. So every parent in New Orleans lists seven schools for their child and submits it to the central office. And then there's some computer uh, much smarter than all of us that runs that based on sibling preference and so forth and then actually assigns rosters to every school based on that, kind of like a medical residency matching model, um, similar to that. And so we can tweak that algorithm based on societal preference in some way. And so one thing we've done and gone back is say if a school wants it, 50% um, of their slots can have a neighborhood preference. So when the computer is running the lottery, kids within an X mile radius actually get first dibs on that school for only half their slots. So. You know, it's a compromise between neighborhood and citywide choice, and you know maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. But I think this is something we're grappling with. We've got time for one more question. I'm going to be the skeptic in the audience. Um, one of the things I hear that I'm concerned about is that there's great profits to be made on charters. Um, and I'm hearing that in regards to, say, federal tax credits, and that a lot of equity firms are looking at charters as a way to make a lot of money. Could you speak to that? And if you don't mind, you know, something like disclosing your salaries. I know that's personal, but that's something that someone like me is interested in. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that the, H, the HISD budget's a billion plus, and if you don't think people are getting rich off of that right now for the results we're getting, then you're being very naive. Um, there's people getting rich right now on the backs of the kids for the results that we're getting. So I guess I would say if, if money's going to be made, and you know that's the reality of the world we live in. Then let's at least get better results than we've gotten over the last several decades. Hey, uh, Mary Lou, let's take one more question. Uh, there is a young lady uh, in the back corner. Thank you, Scott, for still calling me young. <laughs> hey, you know when you get to be my age, most people are young, right? Good morning, guys. Um, I'm really intrigued by this idea of relinquishing and the role of the district or the government to just basically be the, the check against some you know, set of outcomes. I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about what role you see yourselves playing in helping to make sure that the outcomes that the schools are being held to are the right outcomes. 
Sure, I'll start and Chris can end. Um, so I think the way we view this, and uh, I'll give a couple of bad analogies here that might illuminate this, is the government's job is to set the floor. I, the way you might shut down a restaurant, even if people really want to go there, if there's like diseases in the kitchen because it's unsanitary. I don't think at the end of the day you can legislate excellence. Um, and I think excellence is going to mean a different thing for a different parent or a different family. Uh, and that's going to involve more than test scores. It's going to involve character building. It's going to involve extracurricular activities. And I just don't think that's the government's job on some level. Like the government needs to make sure kids are learning reading and math at levels that are going to allow them to be successful in college. Outside of that, this is where I think choice comes in, and that parents can really determine of the schools that are meeting the basic marks in reading and math, let me find the one that's achieving true excellence in the things I value, and parents are going to value different things. So I would think about government accountability as the floor and not the ceiling. Um, and this really, again, gets into what's the role of the superintendent in, in making sure this happens. And I once joked, and I, I, think, I think I kind of actually believe this, that the best superintendent in the world uh, right now could outperform most superintendents by coming into work one day a week, and then, or one day a year, and then living in Costa Rica or wherever have you. And that's when the test scores come out, you just look at everybody in the city and you say, I'm going to allow the 20% to expand as much as they can, and I'm going to transform the bottom 20%, and I'm going to let the top 20% of schools do that and take them over. And I hereby decree this, and I'm going back to the beach. <laughs> and if they did that every year for a decade, we'd get the outcomes we wanted. And I think, to be honest, everything else is just noise, and, and that's what government should be doing. The beach thing sounds good, because <laughs> right now, I'm working my ass off, man. Um, so, uh, I think as far as the framework goes, I mean, I would agree. I mean, we're, we're trying to build, I mean, there's all the normal stuff you'd think you'd seen there around growth and achievement. We're, we're the thing we're trying to toy with, and it's, it's hard to quantify, is some community metrics. Um, and there's no real examples out there to look to, so we're you know we're kind of muddling through that right now, um, and uh, and sitting down with with the schools and, and asking them and trying to bring community leaders into those conversations as well to talk about okay, you know aside from reading and math, what what do you want this school to be able to do and what impact you want it to have on the neighborhood? Um, and it's funny because you ask that question and there's just a lot of silence. I mean, people don't really know what to say. Um, and I think some of it's because th this standardized test and test course thing's been beaten into our head for the last however many years that we'll, that's kind of where the conversation starts and ends right now. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the college thing is, I mean, it's just so far off for the families that we're talking to right now that it's, it's, it's a great aspiration. It's not something that I'm comfortable right now putting into a, an accountability framework and saying that we're gonna judge whether or not your school should stay open. Um, I mean, we may get to that point in a few years, but we're, we're not there right now. So every time we uh, host a uh, speaker series, um, at the end, uh, I want to, I, I feel the need um, to encourage us to do something. Uh, because a lot of times, and I don't know whether it's just endemic to our culture, uh, but we're really good at coming and listening, and because we listened, we think we've done something, right? So it kind of goes back to Doug's question, right? He asked that of me, but I'm going to turn that right back around and ask it of you, right? So I think one of the best things to do after this conversation is to contact a local school board member or your state legislator and basically ask them some questions around what you heard toward Nirav and Chris. And let's see, start hearing what the Texas answer is, right? Uh, because uh, I say this when I travel to other states, these guys are going to get on planes and they're going to go back to their homes. Houston in it is our home. Um, three quick announcements. So uh, A plus has put out a white paper. We've been working in middle schools for three years now. 
and we think uh, we have some, something to say um, about principal leadership, teacher quality, those types of issues, specifically looking at it through the lens of middle school work. And uh, actually the uh, two authors of that white paper are with us today, so I want to acknowledge them. And that is Diane Johnson and Lynn Jenkins. And I also, so thank you very much. I also want to recognize a staff person who was very important to their work, and that is Melissa Davis, who is our Director of Public Affairs. Uh, believe it or not, A-plus is celebrating our 15th birthday uh, this year, right? And uh, so October 10th, we're having a dinner. Uh, we've invited some of those folks that were around uh, 15 years ago when actually uh, Houston, along with 19 other cities, really started uh, what I would argue this move toward uh, urban reform and really thinking about what schools should look like, especially for poor kids. So uh, if you want some more information, that's on our website. Last but not least, uh, we will be co-hosting uh, our next speaker series with Families Empowered. They were mentioned earlier uh, this morning, along with the Greater Houston Partnership. Uh, and uh, so Larry Faulkner is going to moderate a conversation. Uh, Russ Whitehurst from uh, the Brookings Institute will be with us, along with a uh, representative from the Heritage Foundation. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with this, this thought. Um, I got an email uh, late last night uh, from someone, uh, and, and, and it sounded sort of like this. So I see that A plus must be getting their funding from extreme right wing uh, uh, political groups. Um, what's what's going on? And uh, my answer back was, you know, it's funny because A plus is interested in bringing in Democrats, uh, Democrats uh, for education reform. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what A-plus does, right? We try to bring in, whether it's from the right or the left, uh, folks who are going to help us think through issues that are important to our children. And uh, so we're really excited about that event. When I start getting emails like that, I kind of feel as though we're doing something right. I want to thank Neerov and uh, Chris. Let's give them a big round of applause. And I, I kind of like the couch, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Everybody have a good day.